Before we uh, get into balancing equations, I would like to show you an example of a redox reaction. We're going to take a look at this equation, this reaction, where we have iron and copper chloride, and the rearrangement happens, we get iron chloride with copper. And Chem 1, you'd call that a single replacement reaction. Now, am I not it's right? A, it's a bit blurry. It's not okay. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay. What do you have to do to focus? Oh, tap. 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 Double tap. Thank you. <laughs> We're not going to look at this so much as a single replacement. I would say in Chem 1 that the iron is replacing copper in the compound. Uh, it's not quite right. I don't know if I'll say that I lied to my Chem 1 students, but uh, what is the condition of the copper chloride? You notice it's aqueous. That means the copper and the chloride are not even making a compound, really. They're separated. There's copper ions and there's chloride ions. This is a sample of copper chloride. We have a blue solution. Why is it blue? Copper. Copper ions are blue. Yeah. As this reaction happens, notice it is a redox reaction. The copper is positive 2 over here. It reduces to neutral copper over here. And the iron, which is, so the copper is reducing, the iron is neutral there. My iron is this piece of steel wool that I have. It's mostly iron. It's going to oxidize, right? It goes from zero up and it becomes FeCl3, which makes it a positive three. Now, this iron is aqueous as well. So it's not like uh, both of them are kind of fighting to be with the chloride ion. They're really not uh, in reality. They are both trying to fight to whichever one is more stable as a neutral element is going to stay the neutral, and whichever one is more stable as an ion stays as an ion. So if I put the steel wool into the blue copper chloride, and it doesn't happen instantly. It does take a little bit of time. While we wait for this reaction to occur, I've got a couple of terms that I want to introduce you to. This assumes that we haven't gone through any redox yet. It says identify a redox reaction anytime oxidation numbers change. Now, with the precipitation reactions, the acid base reactions, no oxidation numbers were changing. There's, there's a hydrogen ion in the leaves, and somebody grabs a hydrogen ion, but nobody's oxidation number changes. With redox, something has to change. If nothing changes in the oxidation number, then it's not a redox. Now, the two terms I want to introduce you to are this one, and then I've got one other one. The thing that oxidizes, in this case, is the iron oxidizing. It goes from zero up to positive three. The thing that oxidizes is called the reducing agent. It seems like it's kind of confusing. It is. And then the thing that reduces is known as the oxidizing agent. So it is confusing. You would want to think that the thing that oxidizes is called the oxidizing agent. That's not true. The way these terms work is like this. Iron itself is oxidizing. That means it's giving off electrons. It's providing electrons in order for copper to reduce. So therefore, the iron is known as the reducing agent. It's what's helping the, uh, the copper reduce. That's what an agent does. Agent helps you to do something. So the copper is taking electrons. That's allowing or helping the iron to lose electrons. So a copper would be considered, because it's reducing, it's considered the oxidizing agent. Yes? So, okay, just a 
question kind of unrelated, but the, does oxidation this thing like this term has direct relationship with oxygen? Yeah, back when before they really understood what oxidation was, they thought that something had to gain oxygen in order to oxidize, like when iron rusts, it's gaining oxygen. Uh, later on, they realized that oxidation is more general and broad than just the gaining of oxygen. So, but they still kept the same word. So yeah, it started as a gain of oxygen. All right, now uh, I asked you to, to wait a little bit. Take a look at the um, the yeah the solution has gone pretty clear, and uh, the steel wool. Can you tell the difference in the color? Rusted. It was gray, and it looks like it is rusted. It's not rust though. Yeah, look at what happens it's in copper. the chemical equation. Copper has reduced. So this, even though copper and rust are very similar in their color, uh, this is metallic copper that you see. Um, and so, and notice also the solution is clear. But tip it up like that, not too much. Uh, it, it's almost clear. The iron ions are a, like a slight yellow color, a, a very faint yellow. So that's more of what we see in the solution is the yellow on the uh, iron and the reddish copper color. So that's an example. Now there's lots of different examples of redox chemistry. Um, this is one of them. Combustion, all combustion reactions are redox too, yeah. So does the copper take the shape of the iron when it hits the iron position? Yeah, it does kind of take the iron's position. It still looks like steel wool, but it doesn't necessarily have to take the same shape. Um, metals will crystallize, mm -hmm. and every metal will crystallize in a different arrangement. Uh, so it kind of looks like it is taken on that fuzzy, um, that steel wool kind of look, but over time, it won't stay together in these uh, uh, fibers like the steel wool, it'll just all kind of crumble and, and sit on the bottom. Can we poke it with this? Yeah, poke away. Just use your pencil or your finger. <laughs> no, no, I don't think you should. Oh, okay. <laughs> You can see a lot of it's crumbled down to the bottom. It doesn't stay together as well as what the uh, steel wool was. No. And there is a lot of steel wool. Not all the steel wool reacts, so we haven't gotten rid of all of that. You can kind of see, as you pick it up, the copper kind of falls off of it, and you see more steel wool. Wrap around some. Yeah. So does that mean it's usually certain reactions, like the limiting? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're going to run out of copper. Once it's not blue anymore, there's no copper ions. So the copper is going to be the limiting reactant. Very good question. Well, let's go on to the balancing. Uh, this is the rules for balancing equations. And then we did this one yesterday, and then we had no more hour to do. So we move on now to try this. Acid environment equation. Can we balance this one? This one is a little bit different from the one we had yesterday. The one we had yesterday started out as an ionic formula, or an ionic equation try to balance. Nothing had its counter ions like Br negative. What was with the bromide? Was it potassium? Was it hydrogen to make it HBr? I don't know. What was with the potassium? What was the uh, chromium? We don't know. In this case, we have all molecules. We would call this the full molecular equation. It's just not balanced yet. When we want to balance an equation, I didn't even put this into the, uh, the order of things that we do, but before you even figure out, I guess it doesn't matter whether you do this before or after you figure out the oxidation numbers, but before you write the half reactions, anything that should be split apart from each other, you should split apart. AS203, does that deserve to get, should we break that up into the AS and the O, or keep it together? We should keep it together for two reasons. One reason is because it's a solid. Solids aren't broken apart anyway. Second reason is because this is a molecular compound. AS and O are both non-metals. This is not an ionic compound, so it doesn't break up anyway. So keep that together. What about the HNO3? What do you know about aqueous HNO3? 
That's a strong acid. acid. That does break apart. It should not be written like HNO3. It should be hydrogen ions and nitrate ions. What about H3ASO4, another acid? Should I break it apart? <laughs> yeah, it's aqueous. It's aqueous, so break it apart. Oh. Nope. No, it's hot. It's a weak acid. It's a weak acid. Weak acids we write together. Keep that formula together. Don't break the hydrogens off of weak acids. Break them off of strong acids. We don't have complete dissociation because it's a weak acid. So that stays together. People like that. <coughs> uh, and then the NO is a molecular compound as well, besides the fact that it's a gas. So it shouldn't be intact as a molecule. All right, so from this point, we go on and we figure out what all the oxidation numbers are. Let's do that. Uh, oxygen, we know, is a negative 2. What about the AS? Uh, positive 3. Positive 3. Yeah? Hydrogen is positive 1 because the charge is positive 1. Nitrate, we've done this one already. What was negative 2? What's the end? Positive 5. five. And nitrate, positive 5. Uh, and then the H3ASO4. I know the H is positive 1 and the O is negative 2. What does that make the S? The AS. 5. Plus 5. Plus 5. Yeah, it's a 5. And then we have NO, positive 2 and negative 2. Can we identify who oxidizes and who reduces? Yeah. Who oxidizes? The AS. AS oxidizes, yeah. So the half reaction looks like this. Because I couldn't break this thing apart, I still can't break it apart. When you put it in the net, uh, not the net, in the oxidation half reaction, you've got to include the entire term that that AS is in. You don't just put AS plus three. Uh, and then at the end, the form that it's in is this thing. This, because it's a weak acid, you have to keep the H on. It looks like that. Yes, sir. Sorry, positive five, negative two. The oxidation I was thinking that was not well written. Who gets reduced? Uh, the, the N. What? The nitrogen does, yes. Uh, so the nitrogen starts in the form of nitrate. You don't have to put the H on this one because the H is broken off of it. The term that the N is in is just a nitrate on it. And then it becomes NO. We have our half reactions written. Next thing. Balance the both half reactions for first atoms. Make sure you have the same number of atoms on both sides. Start with the non-H and O elements. So we have two AFs over on the left. We only have one on the right. So the first thing that we'll do is put a two in front of that term over there to be, balance the AFs. Now there's just H's and O's left. I'll come back to that. There's one N there and one N there. That's fine except for H's and O's. So um, back up we go to the oxidation half. O's go first. Not H's, because when you balance the O's, you have to throw water on there, and that introduces more hydrogen. So always do the H's last. We have three O's on the left. We have eight O's on the right. So I better add some more O's. I'm going to need five of them. They're, remember, in the form of water molecules. We doing okay here with what we did yesterday? The same steps. Okay, now we have hydrogens that have been thrown in here. We have 10 hydrogens on the left, and we only have six hydrogens on the right. Don't miss those hydrogens. So we'll have to balance the hydrogens with another four over there on the right. Now we've got 10 on both sides. For the reduction half reaction, I've got three O's there and one O there. So I need two more oxygens, that's two waters, and bringing in four hydrogen ions would be needed to make those waters. Okay, so far, both half reactions now are balanced in their atoms. Mm -hmm. The next thing is to balance the charges. When we balance the charges, we have to put electrons in. The oxidation always gives off electrons, and the reduction always takes in electrons. How many electrons is, are going to be given off by the oxidation? Left side is neutral. The right side, that's neutral, that's positive four. So how many electrons? Four. four. Right, if my left side is neutral, I'm going to have to add four electrons. 
to get this side neutral, balance the left. And what about for the reduction half? Looks like this 